If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 14. We're going to read one verse there, uh, verse 34. As uh, we approach in, uh, on Tuesday, the, uh, if I got my math right, 247th birthday of our nation. And we're going to talk a little, little bit about that this morning. Got up, uh, or I, uh, we got up yesterday morning. Amy looked at me and said, "Happy anniversary!" And I was like, and "I said, oh, church." And she said, uh, "She said yes." I said, "Well, thank you." Uh, ten years. Where is ten years gone? I, I think back uh, how old our children are, and then think about. Ten years ago, how old they were then, and uh, we have uh, we have grown. They have certainly grown physically, spiritually since then, and uh, we thank y'all for uh, putting up with us for ten years. Uh, Proverbs fourteen in verse number thirty four says, uh, "Righteousness exalteth a nation." <clears throat> But sin is a reproach to any people. Let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you for your many, many blessings. Thank you for you allowing us to be gathered as we are today. Thank you for these 10 years you've blessed us with here at Springfield First Baptist Church. Thank you for our nation, Lord, that... Uh, you have blessed tremendously... Lord, I don't, I don't believe we've all gave you the credit for all that that uh, you so richly deserve. And Lord, as we look to your word today, open our hearts up to it. If there be any, any that's lost, undone without you, we ask you to save them before it's everlasting too late. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Matthew Henry right said, uh, wrote this, uh, Justice reigning in a nation puts an honor upon it. A righteous administration of the government, impartial equity between man and man, public countenance given to religion, the general practice and profession of virtue, the protecting and pers uh, persevering of virtuous men, charity and compassion to strangers, these exalt the nation. They uphold the throne. Elevate the people's minds and qualify a nation for the favor of God, which will make them high as a holy nation. Sin, on the other hand, reigning in the nation, puts disgrace upon it. Sin is a reproach to any city or kingdom. Renders them despicable among their neighbors. The people of Israel are often instances of both parts of this observation. They were great when they were good. But when they forsook God, all about them insulted them and trampled on them. It is therefore the interest and duty of princes to use their power for the suppression of sin and support, or, or he says vice, and support of virtue. So 247 years later, where are we? Uh, I found a quote that uh, was attributed to James Madison, and then I did some digging, and uh, there's some folks that says, "Ah, uh, oh, no, nah, he didn't. He didn't say that." And there's others that say, "Well, yeah, yeah, he did." And even gave the source, and I went to the source, and uh, I couldn't find it. But if he said it, or if he didn't. Our forefathers, as they wrote the Constitution, he was one of them that wrote, helped write the Constitution, had this in mind when they formed this nation. God wasn't going to be forsaken. And somebody might say, well, what about the separation of church and state? And I'll ask you this. What amendment says that? They ain't one. But the First Amendment gives us the freedom of religion. 
it tells us that the government will not set up a denomination. So we in the United States of America are free to worship God in our own individual way. That's a freedom that down through the years, so many people have put their lives on the line to keep that freedom. To keep that freedom. Adrian Rogers wrote this. I'd much rather leave to my children and my grandchildren a godly heritage sown by a godly nation than to leave to them great wealth to be squandered by a godless society. The great need in America today is righteousness. There's only one way to be righteous. Uh, now, we quote this quite a bit. If you turn over with me to Isaiah 64 and verse 6, we'll, we'll get it, let you see it. If you haven't got it marked, I got mine marked, got it highlighted, got it underlined. What Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says. Brother Butler, I think I've shared this with you before, shared this story several times as I was listening to him preach. And it was about... Uh, these three boys walking down the street and uh, the squirrel had been run over. And them young boys got to debating amongst each other whether or not squirrels went to heaven. Matter of fact, the first boy said, y'all reckon that squirrel's in heaven now? And the second little boy said, well, uh, my daddy says that if I'm a good little boy, that I'll go to heaven. The third little boy said, well, my daddy says this, that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you'll go to heaven. So the debate was, the second little boy said, well, if that squirrel's good, if he was to live a good life, he was good to everybody, he's there. But the third little boy said, I don't know, you, you've got to, if that squirrel put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, He's there. Now, can squirrels do that? Uh, I'll let you decide that. But I want you to look at Isaiah 64 and verse 6. Because we uh, proclaim oh, how good we are, how good we're doing. If we was in the office, we'd say, well, hey, look here what I've done, what I've voted for, what I've done this, what I've done that. And I just want to tell you this. Several years ago, Cloverdale Junior High School became a Title I school, which means that we got money from the federal government to do a lot of stuff that we couldn't do beforehand. It, it means that a great percentage of our students at Cloverdale Junior High School were on free and reduced lunch. When I, I don't know what it was when we first got on that. When I left, 75% of our students there were on free and reduced lunch. There ain't no shame in that. I'm, I'm just telling you what I know. And with that money, we, like I said, we did a lot of things. One of them was we had the, the best computer lab in the school system. And this fellow was running for office. Re-election it was. And he came... To visit us one day, and I thought, well, hey, look at that. He's coming out here to Cloverdale. I drove all the way out here to Cloverdale, Alabama to see us. He went and got his picture made in the computer lab, and in his campaign brochures, he's touting, oh, I'm for education, for technology in education. And I'm thinking, now, the guy down the street that's getting this pamphlet, he don't know that he had nothing to do with us getting that federal money because he's a state representative but hey look how good we are look how good i am that's what we'll hear look what i've done well if we do a little digging 
Did they actually do what they said they did? Righteousness. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing. Now, would anybody campaign on that? I don't know. What I'd like to hear from somebody running for office is, what's your testimony? How old were you when you were saved? How often do you attend church? How often does your family worship together? But instead, we hear about everything else. The motto on our money is still, in God we trust. But as a nation, 247 years later, do we? Are we still trusting in that money that that's printed on? But we are all, as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Mm. You say, well, translate that into grassy for us. The best we got to offer is filthy rags. If we, sit, if we can sit there just for a moment and think of the best thing that we've ever done in our life, where people patted us on the back, patted us on the head, congratulated us, whatever, and we just sit around from time to time just thinking on that. Man, that was a great day. It's his filthy rags before God. Our best is just filthy rags before God. Here's something else you won't hear about in the campaign ads. For the most part, and we do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, our sins, like the wind, have taken us away. Paul wrote in Romans 3, 23 this way, For we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But there's hope. There is hope. If you turn over women to Romans chapter 5, Jesus died for us. Romans 10 tells us if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Romans 6.23 says the wages of the sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Romans 5 and verse 1. When we come to him, he calls us righteous because we put on his righteousness. Oh, uh, in another self? No, -uh. no. Mm -mm. But in Christ Jesus, we can be called right. Uh, one of my students at school, uh, I, I tried to get several of them to follow me in this, and uh, some people are not followers, you know. So anyway, I had one that his nickname became No No. And you say, well, how did he get his nickname name called No No? Because he's the only one, for the most part, that followed my lead and did what he was supposed to do. I asked the whole class. I said, uh, how old were you before you realized your name wasn't No No? And uh, he'd, he'd heard me talking to a few, a few more, and finally I got to him. I said, uh, Garrett, Mr. Patterson, how, how long, how old were you before you realized your name wasn't no no? And he looked at me and he said, My name's not no no? I said, No, your, your name's not no no. But that's what everybody called him from then on. What's, if God was to give us a nickname, what would our nickname be?
he calls us righteous here, according to Romans 5 and verse 1. Therefore being justified, therefore being called righteous. Why, how can we be called righteous? Because we've put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. And those filthy rags have been laid aside and we put on that purple robe because we're a child of the king. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You've seen it. I've seen it. Church sign says, uh, no Jesus, that'd be N-O, Jesus. No peace, N-O, peace. And then down below that it says, no Jesus, K-N-O-W, Jesus. No peace, K-N-O-W, peace. No Jesus, you ain't got peace. But if you know Jesus, if you know him as he's your Lord and Savior, You've got peace. Why? Because he's justified us. He's called us righteous. Our, our, in and of ourselves, our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. You say, well, what, how does this apply to Proverbs chapter 14? Well, let's look back for just a minute. Righteousness exalteth the nation. Righteousness, a, part, a group of people who have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior who make up the citizenship of a country is going to build up a nation. Revival time, this is... Uh, Probably the most used verse in revival time. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and we'll, we'll forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, I'm bothered. I've heard from some of y'all. Y'all are bothered by certain places that we frequent has all of a sudden started saying, hey, let's sell this. We can get that group to come in. Then there's a group saying, well, we ought to boycott it. Well, hey, I'm all in favor of that. But if we boycotted sinners, we better get us a farm, till up some soil, get us some farm animal. I don't know who we're going to buy them from. We're going to have to grow everything ourselves if we ain't going to deal with folks. And then we'd still have to deal with them. Adrian Rogers says this. What is righteousness? Righteousness is responsibility assumed. And the more responsibility that you assume, the more liberty you have. And he gives this story. For example, a little baby doesn't assume any responsibilities. He doesn't have to go out and earn a living. He doesn't have to mow the grass. He doesn't have to do the laundry. He doesn't have to do the grocery shopping. Little baby assumes no responsibilities. Now, you've been around me when I'm around a child. You've probably heard me say this. They, lit, they got it made right now. They have got it made. They are living a life. Everybody does everything for them. 
takes care of them, feeds them, cooks for them, bathes them, everything. That baby assumes no responsibilities. He's fed, bathed, carried from this place to that place. He doesn't make choices about anything. He doesn't have any liberties either because he assumes no responsibilities. And that's what too many Americans want. We want somebody to take care of us. We want to go, like that little fella, uh, one of my coworkers trying to make a point one time. He said, uh, you know, you lazy, you're not doing your school work. What in the world are you going to do for a living? How are you going to make money? I guess I'll just go to the mailbox and get my check. That was years ago. And little did we realize where we're at today. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Didn't think I was going to quote this today, but uh, hey, President Kennedy, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. What can you do? You can worship God. Because righteousness builds up. Exalteth a nation. Righteousness exalteth a nation. But if we talk a great deal about the Lord, if we was uh, in the national office and we talked a good deal about the Lord, I'm afraid we would be the fodder, the kindling for the fire on the late night shows on TV. All the comedians would be talking about us. The liberal media would just eat us alive. All because what? Because of our faith. But righteousness exalteth a nation. A couple of places, if you... Uh, don't feel like turning. I think Justin have them up on the screen. Uh, Psalm 33, verse number 12. Psalm 33, in verse number 12. Blessed is the nation. Blessed is the nation. Happy is the nation. To be envied is the nation. Whose God is the Lord. And the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Now, going on over toward the end of Proverbs. Proverbs 29 and verse number 2. It says this. When the righteous. Now, let's, let's back up for just a minute. Not the people who consider themselves to be righteous, but when the righteous, that was trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the only way we can be righteous. When those are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Matthew 5, 13, we won't turn there. It says simply this, ye are the salt of the earth. Salt does a lot of things. Now, back when Ronnie and I was in about, the, I don't know, third grade, uh, somebody, back then you could have salt shakers on the tables at school. Now you have to ask for it, and you may be told no, or maybe be told it's over yonder, what, whatever. But back then they had the salt shakers on the table. And you've heard me tell this, that uh, the thing to do was to, when you got done, is to loosen the salt shaker top where the next person, they may have fixed to get some salt. And I remember Terry Johnston filled up almost, he had a pretty good size compartment of his tray with French fries and then he got that salt shaker somebody rigged up. And I mean, I don't, you couldn't tell where fries was where salt ended. He ate them. Salt? No. He, well, he probably left some salt. But what did he spend the rest of the day doing? Uh, can I go get a drink of water? I'm thirsty. 
And uh, now I'm starting to get back. Can I go get another drink of water? Why? Because salt makes folks thirsty. We're to make folks th thirsty for the Lord. But what, all, what also does salt do? do? It cleanses. It purifies, it preserves, it penetrates. <laughs> but a salt that has lost its saltness, saltiness, what's it to be done? Well, he also tells us this in Matthew 5, 13. If the salt loses its savor, it is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the feet of men. Just as righteousness exalts a nation, Proverbs 34 verse 14 says, sin is a reproach to any people. I am convinced that uh, as a nation, not every, I ain't thinking that everybody, the minority of folks, I'm afraid, this day and time still read Romans 1, chapter 1 and chapter 2. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that there are folks that if they read the Bible, they get to that part, they either scratch it off or say, oh, no, and just keep flipping. Because sin is reproach to any people. Why in the world do we celebrate it? Why do we call today, as a nation, I ain't saying everybody, but as a nation, we hear a lot more celebration on sin than we do celebrating God. In Romania, there was a dictator, and he decided that uh, He's anti-church. Matter of fact, he pretty much anti-people. Now, how does, how's a fella going to stay in charge if he anti-everything? Well, he, he started out on the church. He went to one city, and there was a building there, and he, he, was, uh, he had gone to inspect one of these factories, and he said to one of his leaders, said, what, what is that building right over there? And they said, uh, that's a Baptist church. And he said, a what? Destroy that building. When they finally arrested him, three days later, they put him before a firing squad. When they finally arrested him, one of the charges was genocide. 60,000 people he just... I just do do away with them. Just do away with them. It got to the point where he'd set up a thing that uh, everybody in the country, if you had a vehicle, 10 liters of gas is all you can put in there. And so when he went to escape, that's what got him. He ran out of gas. And they got him. They caught him. And this dictator set out to try to do away with the church. Now, you listen to the news. You hear this. You hear that. But I want you to know this. Y'all know it. There is a God who's in charge. The book of Deuteronomy tells me this. And it's talking, when it says this, it's talking about we look around, we see the unrighteous seem to be ahead of everybody that churchgoer, Christian. It says this. In due time, their foot shall slide. In due time, their foot 
shall slide. So how can we exalt a nation? Do you know Jesus? Sometime this way the conversation might come up. You know, you might be around somebody and they say, well, I've got this going on. And it just, uh, it's just re seems to be wrecking my life. We've got this over here going on. It, it ain't happy neither. Uh, have you got any suggestions? Have this on the, the front part of your mind. Have you tried Jesus? Have you tried Jesus? Have you tried him? Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. It's time that we, as Americans, Let folks know there's a God. There's an eternity waiting on us. As time goes, 247 years ain't much. You say, well, you know anybody that's 247 years old? Uh, Methuselah lived 969 years, so 247 ain't much. And in reading my Bible, no country is going to last all eternity. Reading history, countries fall. And I'm just going to leave you with this today. Righteousness builds up, exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. And I'll heal their land. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your many, many blessings. Thank you for blessing our country such as you have. Lord, I ask you to continue to bless our country. Send revival to our land. Righteousness builds up, exalteth the nation. Lord, today, uh, seems like everywhere we turn, the reproach to a people is sin, and that's been what's celebrated. You're, Lord, a lot of times you're not. Shame on us as your children for not celebrating you more in our everyday walk. As we rub elbows, Lord, with folks this week, may they know this. Right there's a child of God. Right there is a child of God. Lord, may we be the salt and light you saved us to be. Lord, if we're not saved, I can think of no better time than right now today. Lord, to have your way in each one of our lives, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.